right I've done a new introductory slide here which looks a bit more impressive than the usual ones um, so this is the um, learning outcome to understand the main approaches to managing individuals and if we move on there so the learning outcome is fairly straightforward analyze how different behavioral characteristics of individuals can impact upon the management in procurement and supply now that question has been asked twice before the very question and they've just linked it to the case study so they basically asked the question how can behavioral characteristics impact on fred mary and their new job in procurement um, so what are the behavioral characteristics well there are differences amongst individuals there are obviously uniquenesses maybe similarities and there's this um, theoretical viewpoint of people which is called the ideographic approach there's this concept called emotional intelligence which you'll have come across before in your negotiation studies um, that it's different than IQ the EQ is about soft skills being in touch with your feelings and understanding how other people feel so a very very important um, concept is EI then managing diversity um, which is relatively straightforward with the benefits of so a nice little section but we've got unfortunately from your point we've got some three or four new theories and we'll look at the particular the Myers-Briggs test that which you completed um, your boo on that and we'll, we'll see what that means if anything okay so there they're the um, six bullet points that we're going to cover so what makes people different? I think we're all fairly sure of that. Ethnic origin maybe, physique, gender, your family experience, social factors, cultures, your attitude, your traits and personality type, intelligence, perception, very, very broad range, but it gives you a, a very big sort of um, idea of how large this subject is. So quite a few there. And then we've got the concept of personality itself, which obviously behaviors and traits um, explain our personality. So it's an integrating concept, embracing how individuals relate to the environment. It focuses on stable or consistent properties, which means those are the characteristics of an individual. And it focuses on behavior patterns, which may be identified and used consistently in comparisons between them. Perhaps an easier way of thinking about personality is the bottom of the slide here. Simply speaking, it what makes it, it is what makes us who you are and what makes what you do. Sorry when I pronounce it properly, and that that's probably a nice explanation. Um, so it it explains why a person behaves in a particular way. Um, it's stable because generally people have a personality that generally speaking that doesn't change and it could include independence conscientiousness agreeableness and self-control so it's a big concept is um, personality um, there are two schools of thought of how to uh, approach or measure or compare um, there's this yep yeah, I'm not seeing any you know you normally put your notes your slide yeah there's none no the, the notes are on the bottom of the slide but they don't show in the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation but, oh, the, okay. but there are speakers notes so I'll send you the PowerPoint with the speaker oh. notes yes okay. um, now if I present this in presenter mode in PowerPoint it would show um, but I can't do that and record them if, if that makes sense so we've got two theoretical approaches and don't beat yourself too much about the the nomothetic approach therefore is the scientific approach it seeks to identify the main areas or dimensions on which personality can vary this is assuming these are constants it's about testing the personality of groups to derive scores constructing a profile and formulating principles of personality and behavior 
again assuming that personality is largely inherited and so is impervious to environmental factors. The ideographic approach is the opposite of this and it assumes that individuals are unique and that assessment using traits and types is regarded as insufficient to understand how individuals understand and respond to the world. Um, it recognises the concept of self and the self-concept through learning and adaption to the environment, adaptation. So ideographic theory assumes people behave according to a self-understanding developed largely through social interaction. And the Greek word ideographic comes from the Greek word idios meaning own or private. Uh, a very well-known um, approach, a nomothetic approach, um, is Eisenach's four personality types, which um, looks at um, how extrovert people are, stable, sanguine, to how choleric they are, unstable, extrovert, and phlegmatic to melancholic. So there are dimensions of personality uh, from stable to unstable to extroverted to introverted and that's one approach to um, assessing and measuring personality. Um, the approach of Eisnex is measuring really on two dimensions um, as I've said on the previous slide extroversion versus introversion and emotional instability versus emotional stability um, and you could be high on one low on the other you could be anywhere on them continuums and there are four dimensions on the scale and it's a series of questions and if you so wish to test yourself there's a link to a self-test there um, Perhaps more scientifically recognised is the big five personality factors, um, often called ocean because they spell the word ocean, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness and neuroticism, O-C-E-A-N. And it's currently the most widely used model of personality. Uh, the five factor model was formed off the ideas of Gordon, Alport, Cattell and Hans Eisenick but as no one theorist. And again, there are instruments and questionnaires that can be um, used to assess these dimensions. The scores can be positive or negative, depending on the dimension. So on openness, positive score. If you're an explorer, it's scored negatively if you're more of a preserver. Um, another model here is the DIS model. Again, you can read more about it um, at www.123test.com uh, and it's a DISC personality test which looks at um, dominance, influence, steadiness and conscientiousness. So a whole range of dimensions that we're being presented with here. You don't need to learn all these models, but you perhaps need to learn one of them well or at least be able to articulate how personality can vary and typical dimensions. The DISC profile itself can improve your self-knowledge, help work in relationships, better teamwork, develop stronger skills, manage more effectively. Uh, and to be fair, this um, benefits of DISC could be attributed to any of the models. So the benefits of all the models are you will get um, these um, advantages. Um, the alternative approach is the ideographic view um, and one way of um, examining personality on this was developed by Carl Rogers who developed um, something called the Q-sort where the subject is given a set of cards with um, statements on each one I am friendly, I am ambitious etc and then they're asked to sort the cards and one pile con statements that are most like me and one pile of statements is least like me and the one or more piles of statements that are in between um, and in the QSOP the number of cards can be varied etc so that's that's one way of using the um, ideographic approach 
Um, uh, perhaps more useful concept is Eric Erickson's stages of personality development, which recognises that personality isn't something you're born with that's constant and doesn't change. Um, it recognises that you go through stages, stage one to eight, from one year old to old age, and your basic personality changes as you develop through your life cycle. So that's quite an interesting viewpoint. It's not that easy to learn the eight stages, one to year, one to two to three, four to five, six to 11, um, but is, is one method. Eight differences there. Basically, you're either an EI, an S and N, a T and F, or a J or P. So that's pretty much where you came out there, which is very good. That is in the Myers um, Myers Briggs type sixteen. Yes. Yep. So, so does that make more sense now to you, the the test that you um, did your boo on that? Yeah. But it gives you a, by doing the test it's not that important for your work what's important for this exam is that you understand what's in a test what dimensions they're measuring and then based on the result what you can do with it um, so it's um, and the one that we we did was a, a bridged version I think it was just 20 questions the full test um, has I believe 72 questions so the one that we sent out was a very shortened version but suitable for helping you understand what we're trying to achieve. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. So we've got um, Myers-Briggs then is, is a personality test and we've got different personalities. Uh, one view is personality you're born with which is the scientific approach, nom nomothetic, and the other is the um, ideographic which assumes personality um, changes because your experiences, the situation, and it develops. So important um, link to personality is recognizing people have different emotional intelligences, which is the soft skills. People can be very intelligent, but perhaps not have these soft skills. So you get these managers who can be very clever, but perhaps can't manage people. So it's a different skill and it was developed by Goldman and the definition from Goldman is the ability to motivate in the face of frustration, to control impulse, impulse, delay gratification, to regulate one's mood, to keep distress from swamping the ability to think. So it's recognizing maybe that you're getting angry and stopping and just walking away. It's recognizing that you can understand other people's feelings uh, and we've got the explanation there. Understand your emotions, understand and influence the emotions of others, so it's very good in negotiation. It means being aware that emotions can drive behaviour and impact people and learning how to manage the emotions. So as a general concept it's very important and, and any link to that you would say it's different than IQ. Some people call it EQ um, but it can be EI or EQ it's all the same thing. The dimensions from Goldman um, are self-awareness, knowing what we are feeling, self-regulation, controlling our emotions, motivation, using our deepest preferences to move as a guide towards our goals, empathy, self-explanatory, and having social skills, handling emotions in relationships. So there are five dimensions there, unfortunately, uh, there's been so many developments on EI that there are some different authors have different dimensions. The, f the original five are very straightforward. Um, and to be effective, leaders must understand how their emotions affect people. The better a leader relates and works with us, the more successful he or she will be. So understanding these, um, or having these skills and working on them will help you in the future. It underpins leadership qualities. Social skills explicitly underpin leadership tasks. EI supports change management. And Goldman suggests that emotional aptitude is a meta ability. Determine how well we can use what other skills we have. 
and in recruitment and selection there is a lot of people feel that it's the more important um, factor to assess uh, than, than, than peace person's personality it's more important that they've got the soft skills and can work as a team uh, and they've got good communication as to pay them there should be an advantages of diversity of having better ideas better communication more sustainable workforce um, so we do need to be able to discuss benefits of having diversity and how might we manage it test assumptions ensure we've got good policies make sure written and unwritten diversity policies are understood good channels of communication understand views of all listen learn acknowledge all know your cultural diversity biases so subconscious bias can be a problem for everyone um, take care of any workplace social events that can be enjoyed by all workers but not restricted not an easy list to learn but it's a good sort of list is how you might manage or develop <coughs> diversity at work yeah less, less female directors yeah i think that's the classic um example of vertical gender segregation now horizontal used to be let's say the army where people okay. people associate the army with men less so now thank goodness it's changed hasn't it police has changed a long while ago but certain and bus drivers. Sorry? And bus drivers. And bus drivers, yeah. Certainly years ago we had army, miners, steel workers were predominantly men. Um, and factories. Yeah, and factories. Uh, it's changed. It's changed. Um, what affects your work performance? Well, it depends how committed you are, the contribution, the conditions required to support effective working and your capability. Um, so you might be capable but if you aren't committed and motivated it won't lead to good performance um, right so 2.2 hopefully it gets a little bit easier here 2.2 um, is basically learning styles um, and how to develop um, knowledge now the learning styles with with um, we'll come on to that questionnaire in a, a second um, and I'll pause it when we get there um, so how do we learn or what's the outcomes of learning hopefully help us develop a skill more knowledge more competent changes our attitudes fosters awareness develops employability so the outcome not the input of learning maybe that um, how do we learn well we can deliberately learn by going to college doing distance learning but there's also accidental learning through work incidental learning true mistakes yes yeah learn by experience and incidental more unconscious which happens in the course of some other activity but can be captured and applied to other contexts and opportunities opportunistic learning intentional learning where we set out to learn something but use the experience that come to hand rather than formal education so three I don't understand. sorry can you come again with the opportunist opportunistic learning yeah i think opportunities where you deliberately go out to find out about find things. out about things but you aren't necessarily right. going on a searching, such as researching cancer cancer research yeah i think so i think so yeah um, technology obviously can help in learning I'm not going to go through podcasts and YouTubes and Wikipedia and discussion boards but obviously technology can help um, theories of learning quite high concepts here that there's the behavioralist psychology view based on empirical epistemology the view that human mind operates purely on information from the senses and the cognitive psychology based on rational epistemology the view that human mind imposes meaning and organization on sensory data a little bit heavy that but it's pretty much like does everybody see the same thing or is the world a interpretation and it's different to every individual um, so quite high level concepts there the difference between behaviorist and cognitive but epistemology means um, learning theory how do we find out the truth 
how do we how do we know that they're never ever going to ask you a question about epistemology um, so cognitive learning theory is probably the most important if people encourage to have clear goals and if they receive feedback um, then that will help them learn learning will be more effective if if people can experiment discover human beings develop learning set strategies of how to learn and an important goal of work related training is transfer of learning um, the ability to transpose a solution from well learning to other situations hence why rather than call them key skills a lot of people would call them transferable skills so by learning a particular skill it means you can transfer that skill and use it in a different situation um, the most popular model of learning is the called experiential learning which you briefly touched upon which is learning by doing so you actually do something experience it you reflect on it you conceptualize and then you might do something different slightly modify try it again and you go through the cycle this is the SIPS um, slide from the textbook and I, I'm not a big fan of it it should be to the where they are on here so you can see diverges a more concrete experience and reflection um, but if you learn both of these you'll get confused I'll go back to that slide and when you do the test it will give you a um, um, a score on each of these dimensions as to which your preferred learning style is uh, and at the end I don't think I can stop the recording you boo it'll give you a score whether you're more a reflector or more an activist or more a pragmatist or more a theorist now what it means a bit like the personality test it doesn't mean because you're a reflector that's wrong it doesn't mean because you're a more a pragmatist that's wrong what it means is everybody has their own preferred learning style and you have to recognize that you have a preferred style but sometimes you have to realize you need to learn not just by being an activist that you may need to use the other styles so as a team manager you need to recognize your team will have different learning styles you might have people that are um, prefer to reflect people that refer to be more pragmatic so the learning styles isn't being right or wrong um, having one style or the other it's just there are different learning styles um, it's been widely critiqued as this theory that's putting people into boxes and stereotyping but it's a useful idea for understanding training learning can be different with different people I like the Honey and Mumford one and it's the one that we sent the questionnaire through for and I'm not sure that this PowerPoint will let me pause and pick that up I will try um, stick with the Honey and Mumford learning style that um, as a theory and learn the four types the four styles um, I don't think it may come up because it's been asked a few times but don't learn both Kolb and Honey and Mumford just say an important theory on learning was developed by Kolb which is um, learning by experience um, and a, a good test of that on learning styles is the Honey and Mumford test which uh, puts you into one of those four boxes so that's learning learning is linked to knowledge and knowledge management is um, or can lead to be a source of competitive advantage if you do it properly a successful company is knowledge creating can produce new knowledge it can disseminate it throughout the company and embody it so that's the definition of a successful knowledge creating company um, how do we manage knowledge we need to acquire it generate it or create it transform it sorry transform information into knowledge so we have data which is numbers maybe we can change that into information if we can understand information it becomes knowledge and unspoken um, internal tacit knowledge needs converting into explicit knowledge so the, the thing that's unspoken unwritten that some people understand is tacit whereas explicit is it's in your manuals it's written down 
everybody can learn it. So two concepts there, tacit explicit, we need to store knowledge in the management systems, share knowledge, protect knowledge and apply knowledge to develop core capabilities. So a very very useful framework there which I think straightforward the more complex comes in with I think we will definitely come back to on revision um, with the Nanka and Taguchi in a minute so a straight difference between explicit formal systematic documented articulated its words numbers it's easy to communicate store it's the opposite of tacit so tacit is the problem that it's personal hard to formalize difficult to communicate the challenge is to identify which elements of tacit can be captured and made explicit while accepting that just some of it can't be. Tacit knowledge can't be captured, the goal is to connect the possessors of tacit with the seekers of knowledge. So there's a difference here that repeats through your SIP studies. The model that the study guide tends to use um, to explain this is fairly complicated and um, the bottom of the slide has some notes here. Um, I've called it the Seki model, but it was developed by Nanaka and Takushi, not Taguchi. Uh, and Seki is the S E C I. So we go from socialization to externalization to combination to internalization. So what we're trying to do is move tacit knowledge to explicit knowledge, capture it in the systems, use it, and develop new knowledge. Um, so it goes, roughly speaking, it goes clockwise around this model. So there's no problem with explicit knowledge, but how do we get explicit? Well, sharing experiences and models and skills can, which is socialization, can make tacit a bit more tacit, but then we need to make tacit explicit. How can we get it out into the open? Well, we need to articulate tacit knowledge, then we need to systemize it and then we need to embody that knowledge into um, tacit knowledge so it's a very complex model i've done a video link um, on that on the extra videos which gives a very good five minute explanation of this model quite complex i don't know what you think of have, have you seen it before you no it's a, it's it's a difficult one isn't it uh, and I think it's just one we come back to as a separate model and say right on revision we'll spend 10 minutes revising the knowledge model. It's only come up, it's come up three times before in the exams but the concept has been explain knowledge management which means define it, explain why it's important and then a good answer might have referred to Nanaka and Takushi's model and you would have to draw the four box model. Um, it's actually when you look at the revision notes, it, it is straightforward. Um, so what are the problems of knowledge management? Getting employees on board, how to use technology, a lack of goals in the business for knowledge what, management. What, sorry, what yeah. do you mean getting employees on board? What has employees got to do with it? Well, the employees are the people who you're trying to um, manage their knowledge and develop their knowledge. So you're trying to get um, the importance that it's um, knowledge, managing knowledge, capturing knowledge is important to the company, that you can't just have it in people's heads, but you need to keep developing new knowledge and turning that from implicit into explicit. So it's a bit like innovation, you need to keep working on knowledge management because if you don't, the company's not going to go forward. So knowledge eventually gets turned into um, capabilities, so our innovations. So it's linked to innovation and um, capabilities. Technology will help, but we need clear goals. And one of the problems is confusion of information and knowledge, and they are different concepts. Um, it's impossible to manage knowledge. It's, For instance, now, there's some things that I personally will know. Yes. And I will not put down. I know, that's that. That's Stick with me to another organisation. That's right, that's right. Um, it is difficult for companies, um, but they need to know that you know something they don't know, otherwise they'll, they'll never realise till you go they, they haven't got sufficient um, knowledge of how, how someone's done a job. 
So it's like having only one designer who can design the product, that's no good. Um, you've got to have um, business continuity, workforce planning, and you need to um, plan for people leaving, don't you? And think, well, if your boo doesn't turn up tomorrow, can could somebody else do her job? Um, so it is difficult, and companies don't do it well, and it's a, I think it's a bit more of a concept than a practical idea. Um, Senge wrote the famous book, The Learning Organisation, or The Fifth Discipline, and Senge said there are five um, disciplines that companies need to manage to become a learning organisation. I'm not a big fan of this learning organisation, but as a concept, companies need to learn and develop, as opposed to individuals, the company's got to um, um, have these disciplines in place and they talks about um, personal mastery, mental models, shared vision, team learning and systems thinking and Senge maintains that companies need to develop a culture of learning and instill commitment and capacity to learn at all levels and Senge suggests there are five features of a learning organisation. So team learning is one there, the capacity of team members to suspend assumptions and enter into a process of genuine thinking, shared visions about the future, quite a high level concept. Um, Senge is not named on your spec, only knowledge management and learning. So this would only be incidental to a good answer. If you don't like, I'm not a big fan of the Senge's five disciplines, but I, I like the concept of a learning organization, which links to knowledge management. If you've got um, knowledge management, you can have a learning organization. And that's 2.2. Um, but basically in 2.2, it's only learning theory and knowledge management. Uh, and 2.2 obviously gets examined one in four in your exams. The perhaps more popular one is 2.3, motivation. Are uh, you happy to go? Yeah. So we've touched a little on it. You've done it in scientific management, in operations management and Mayo. So it links to that. Motivation can be extrinsic, intrinsic. There are frustration induced and constructive behaviours, content theories and motivation process theories and equity goal theories and motivation. So a big area on the syllabus. Um, we're all happy with what motivation is. It's something that makes individuals want and chooses to engage in behaviours. So studying for money. Yes, it could be money, but we'll, we'll look. Yeah, that could, that could be our ambition, that's right. Studying for SIPs, you need to be motivated. <laughs> You're very motivated. So motivation is individual. It's usually intentional. It's multifaceted. And motivation theory is to try and predict behaviour. Um, now, the syllabus talks about the difference between content theories and process theories. So the early theories came from scientific management, Taylor, Hawthorne experiments, and then there's many other theories developed. These can be split into what motivates people, the content theories such as Maslow and Hertzberg, and the process of motivation, which we're going to look at, which is expectancy theory, equity theory, and goal theory. Um, the various theories are not conclusive but provide a useful framework. So some of the theories we're going to look at are content theories, what individual motivates you like money, and the others are the actual process of doing something that, that motivates you. So content versus process, just hang that thought as we go through this. Um, there is also the concept of job satisfaction, which is slightly different than motivation. <clears throat> but low morale, dissatisfaction or demotivation can impact performance, absenteeism, people leaving, bad timekeeping, bad communication. So if we aren't motivated, it's got many, many problems. And Maslow, to be quite honest of me, so the four theories there. Now, the unit content also talks about the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So some things 
that we've talked about are intrinsic that come from within yourself and some things are extrinsic um, such as salary, bonuses, company cars, promotion um, external. Yeah, external. So that, roughly speaking, it's internal in your head, external, something you receive. So when we look at the theory, some things can be classed as intrinsic, some things can be classed as extrinsic. Is Vroom. Um, lock is fairly straightforward, that you need to set clear goals, feedback, and the diagram's fairly self-explanatory. Now they could only ask you that as part of a question if they asked you about process theories. They can't mm -hmm. ask you about Locke or Porter and Lawler by name. So if you know at least two process theories such as equity theory, Vroom, Locke, that would be sufficient? Vroom? Yeah, so Vroom was earlier on wasn't it? Yeah, and Locke, I think I'm Locke slightly different order. So we've got lock. Um, now we're on to equity theory which is very easy. Basically is it worth the effort for the reward and is it fair? So there's two things in equity theory. It's not um, it's not only about is it worth the effort for the reward but am I being treated fairly to others? Are they having to do less effort for more rewards? So people don't just look at their effort, their reward, when you're thinking is it fair, equitable, you're looking at what they call reference there, other people. Now, if you compare to another buyer in your department and you feel they're getting more rewards for less effort or different effort, you'd think that wasn't equitable. So the theory is fairly straightforward. Is my effort, my reward um, fair in relation to um, people? Um, so it can create a sense of unpleasant dissonance um, and what do we do? We might need to change inputs to match the outputs and rewards or we might need to change the outputs to match the inputs. Uh, we need to um, perhaps change the reference points for comparison and say well you shouldn't be comparing to that buyer, they're a senior buyer, you're a buyer, they're getting this reward because they're doing a, a more strategic role. Um, so there are various policies there. So so what leads to it? Pay is perceived to be fair, motivations sustained. If it's underpayment, employer will seek justice, work motivations disrupted. Overpayment could be a problem. In other cultures, people might lose face. So what's the problem with it? Inequity, reduced effort, grievances, criticism, withdrawal. So fairly obvious problems I think with equity. How do we apply it, develop tools to pay people in proportion to contribution, let employees know who their pay reference are in the pay system. So it's like saying well you're equivalent to a team leader in accounts um, and you might think well, that's fair they've got similar responsibilities, similar this. Um, strive for consistent pay allocations, monitor pay structures. So it's not just pay, but it, it is predominantly about pay. Um, what makes you frustrated? Well, um, frustration leads to aggression, regression, fixation and withdrawal. And it depends whether there are blockages, things that prevent you solving problems and meeting your needs. So if a motivational force is blocked before you can reach your goal, you could react positively and problem solve it or you may become frustrated um, and become defensive. So it depends on the situation but it can lead to constructive behaviour or frustration and frustration is aggression, regression, fixation or possibly worse still withdrawal, absenteeism, giving up, not trying. So people can become frustrated um, and in your case study you could get examples of buyers who are frustrated because of the blockages um, that are stopping them being motivated in their work. Um, most forms of frustration induced behaviours are a combination of aggression, regression and... Uh, so that section, uh, 
fairly straightforward on um, behaviours and motivation. Lots of theories of motivation though. There was the process theories, um, the content theories, there was the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic, um, and there was the um, Maslow, Hertzberg, Locke, um, Adams uh, theories of motivation. So some big sections there. Uh, one last model, one last model that's going to come here that's in your study guide and it's one of my favourites. This says analyse factors that influence job satisfaction. Now this isn't motivation, it's job satisfaction. Three diagrams, you only need one of them. I think the visual there just helps you understand. So that's Hackman and Adam. What will it alienate you at work? Um, powerlessness, meaninglessness of your job, isolation at work, <coughs> and perhaps self estrangement. Very similar to the frustration. Self estrangement. Yeah, this can you say loss of personal identity in any sense that work is important in your life? Work is so only so. So you aren't getting any satisfaction from your job, you find it meaningless. Um, there's no significance. It's a bit similar. They're all very similar, aren't they? Um, work is solely a means of satisfaction. So you're going to work to pay for the mortgage, not to have social interactions and and, and you don't enjoy it. Um, how do we get employees to be more committed? More better leadership? More identification with the company's values? Better accountability management? making sure they know what they have to achieve, reward systems, and the employee being more caring. And can you say this concept is commitment, not motivation? Are you committed to your organisation? Do you feel loyal to them? So these are all things that can improve commitment. Um, we can design the job properly, decide on the tasks, the most efficient way, and train people. So job design is important. We can maybe do job rotation, job enlargement and job enrichment which can help us be more satisfied. So that's to do with the job. So that can lead to job satisfaction. Um, can we empower all staff and give them decisions? No, not everybody wants it. Not are capable of doing it. Some managers can never let go. I'm sure we've all worked for them who can't delegate and can't empower people to make decisions. Um, you still need reward so it's not a substitute and empowerment may be perceived as a poor alternative to promotion so it needs handling very carefully does empowerment we need work-life balance that's going to help us be satisfied that we've got flexi time maybe maybe job sharing flexible contracts so having a good work-life balance very very important um, right um, we come on some management theory now, not too much, but how satisfied you at work may depend on your manager's style of management. One of the most well-known um, theories or grids for management is Blake and Mouton's, which said there are five management styles, which can be country club, where you're not concerned at all about production and output, but you're very concern for people, you're just a people person. Um, but you might be a hard taskmaster and just concerned about the job and not them, a nine one -er. Ideally you should be a nine one -er, where you're bothered about the people and concerned for production. Um, you could be middle of the road or you could be what's called impoverished where you aren't, you've just withdrawn, you're doing nothing. So the style of management can be described with this Blake and Mouton um, and there may be times when you need to be task orientated um, but team management is the ideal so that's concern for people concern for production and it introduces style of management um, that says basically um, you can be very task orientated autocratic right through to more democratic relationship orientated and there's a continuum there isn't just four styles so you can be anywhere on this continuum 
and it largely depends upon the situation, the team, the task, uh, how quickly it needs to be done. So you've got various styles there, from manager makes all the decisions to managers allow subordinates to act as they wish within limits. So how much are you going to let them make the decision? How much are you going to make the decision? I could never remember that and I don't think anyone could for an exam but what you would need which style of um, management should one adapt well Tannenbaum and Schmidt provided some guidance in this matter they suggested there are three major forces which impact on the style of management for a particular um, um, situation um, they suggest that the forces in the manager themselves their values, their style, their assessment of the risk will impact on the decision. The forces in the team member, which are your assessment of their readiness and enthusiasm to assume responsibility. And also the forces in the situation, the actual time pressure to complete the activity, the group's effectiveness, the um, organisational culture, uh, were all impact upon forces in the situation. So some very useful guidance there from Tannebun and Schmidt on factors that need to be considered when deciding on the management style. The exam is um, that these styles can be broadly put into autocratic can be called tell, sell is persuasive, consult is participative and joins is democratic so the four styles 